The Council's roles. As mentioned earlier, the roles of the various EU institutions are best represented by a so-called decision-making triangle, a metaphor aimed at illustrating their interdependence and cooperation in EU decision-making. In this triangle, where the Council of Ministers represents the governments of the EU's member states, its main roles are to amend and adopt EU laws jointly with the European Parliament based on the European Commission's proposals, develop the EU's foreign and security policy, drawing on European Council guidelines, conclude agreements between the EU and third countries and international organisations, and adopt the annual EU budget together with the European Parliament. In specific policy areas, like the economic policies of the Member States, the Council doesn't have direct decision-making powers. This is due to the principle of subsidiarity, where decisions are taken as closely as possible to the citizens, in this case, on national instead of European level. In these areas, the Council's role is to coordinate national policies, ensuring a harmonised approach across Member States, given the economic and monetary interdependence of Member States. This means that although each Member State retains the right to formulate its own national economic, employment, health and social policies, they also agreed that coordination at the European level is needed. Consequently, Member States have decided to set common goals and broadly align their efforts in these fields through the so-called Open Method of Coordination, or OMC for short, where the Council adopts non-binding guidelines to achieve these goals. We can consider OMC as a form of soft law, as it is intergovernmental policy making that does not result in binding EU legislative measures and it does not require EU countries to introduce or amend their laws. The role of the Council of Ministers in adopting EU laws can be grouped into two categories. Those related to the Common Foreign and Security Policy, CFSP for short, and all other policy areas. Let's examine them now. Decision-making in the Common Foreign and Security Policy, CFSP, operates under the principle of intergovernmentalism. This approach means that policies are not decided by a central EU institution, but are shaped through cooperation and coordination among the governments of the 27 member states. It emphasises the independence and autonomy of individual nations within the EU framework. In this field, it is the Council of the EU Foreign Ministers that holds the right of initiative, contrary to all other policy fields where it is the European Commission that has this right. However, the High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, who is also the Vice President of the European Commission, can also make foreign affairs related proposals to the Council. It is worth mentioning that the European Council, the summit of the top political leaders of the EU member states that we discuss shortly in this session, who are in fact the bosses of the foreign ministers, can define general guidelines for the CFSP, which serve as a framework for the specific policy, funding and other decisions that the foreign ministers can take. In the past, police and judicial cooperation in criminal matters had also fallen under the intergovernmental decision-making, but the Treaty of Lisbon changed that in 2009. Decisions since then are made on the EU level. However, individual member states still have the power to propose legislation in this area, a power of initiative shared here with the European Commission. The Parliament is merely consulted on specific measures for judicial cooperation in criminal matters, which are then adopted unanimously by the Council. In the absence of unanimity in the Council, it is still possible for nine or more member states to work together on the basis of a so-called enhanced cooperation that we discuss in the module called EU Essentials. 
Case study. In response to Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, which began on the 24th of February 2022, the EU has imposed massive and unprecedented sanctions against Russia. They supplemented existing measures already imposed on Russia since 2014 after its annexation of Crimea and the non-implementation of the so-called Minsk agreements. The sanctions include restrictive measures targeted at individuals, economic sanctions and visa measures. The EU has also imposed sanctions on Belarus for its involvement in Russia's invasion of Ukraine and on Iran over the supply of drones to Russia. The economic sanctions, including import and export restrictions, aim to create severe consequences for Russia and to make it difficult to continue its war. The list of banned products, which includes luxury goods, raw materials for steel production, processed aluminium products and other metal goods, certain types of cement, rubber products, wood, spirits, liquor, high-end seafood, is designed to maximise the negative impact of the sanctions on the Russian economy while limiting the consequences for EU businesses and citizens, as well as limiting the unintended consequences on the Russian population. Aside from the economic sanctions, certain high-ranking or politically relevant individuals, such as Vladimir Putin, the Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, and many others were also personally sanctioned. According to the European Commission, since February 2022, the EU has banned over 43.9 billion euros in goods that would have been exported to Russia and 91.2 billion in goods that would have been imported from Russia. This means that in comparison with 2021, export and import volumes, 49% of exports and 58% of imports were sanctioned. Since December 2023, there is also a ban on Russian diamonds as part of a G7 effort to develop an internationally coordinated diamond ban that aims to deprive Russia of this important revenue source. Sanctions are an essential tool in the EU's Common Foreign and Security Policy, CFSP, and despite their name, they are not punitive, but intended to bring about change in harmful policies or activities. Decisions on sanctions, be it their adoption, renewal or lifting, are taken by the Council of the EU based on proposals for the High Representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. Given their highly sensitive and political nature, national leaders play an active role in such decisions, even if formally speaking, the decisions are made on the level of the foreign affairs ministers. The European Commission, together with the High Representative, make joint proposals of sanctions to the Council of the EU for adoption by unanimity. Once adopted, the European Commission as a guardian of the treaties plays a vital role in overseeing sanctions implementation by member states. Once a proposal for restrictive measures is made by the High Representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, it is then examined and discussed by the relevant Council preparatory bodies. The Council Working Party, responsible for the geographical region to which the targeted country belongs, for example, the Eastern Europe and Central Asia Working Party, COEST, for Ukraine or Belarus. If required, the Political and Security Committee, PSC, and the Committee of Permanent Representatives, CoREPA II. The decision is then adopted, as we mentioned, by the Council in unanimity, and if it includes an asset freeze and or other types of economic and or financial sanctions, those measures need to be implemented in a Council regulation. In all other policy areas, the Council of Ministers, usually together with the European Parliament, has the decision-making role. It amends, adopts or rejects the proposals of the European Commission, following the steps of the Ordinary Legislative Procedure, or OLP, to which we have dedicated a separate session, 
or other special legislative procedures. Examples of these are policies related to economic development, foreign trade and agriculture.